Oh boy, oh boy, it's that time once again, not for a Trek Actually video, for a Not Actually Trek Actually video, but even less than that, for a Not Actually Trek Actually video that requires minimal effort on my part, because you have already done the work for me by leaving comments on my recent Trek Actually and Not Actually Trek Actually videos, some of which I will now respond to. I love low effort content. Let's get started. These first several comments were left on my most recent Not Actually Trek Actually video about the Klingons of Star Trek Voyager and Enterprise. This first one is from Captain Andy, who says, They went to all the trouble of explaining why Klingons have flat foreheads, but not why they started cutting their hair short. Hopefully that will be explained in a season-long story arc of some series in the near future. Oh, Andy, you can't just rush something like that out in a single season. A story of that importance, a story like that, that demands to be told, must be the subject of a multi-season arc. It's got to be like a five-year story. They need to do the full Straczynski on that. How else will people finally know why Klingons change their hairstyle. We need we, we need at least 100 episodes. Uh, I, it needs to be five 20-episode seasons meticulously planned out from episode one to episode 100, and episode 100 needs to be like a four-hour epic television event so that we can all gather the family around and sit in front of the TV like the old days and learn why. Why, after all these years, the mystery the question that has burned at the heart of Star Trek. Why did the Klingons change their hair? Here's one from Stephen Sutton. The arc spanning Enterprise's seasons 7 through 10 explaining self-sealing stem bolts would have been riveting. Now see, that is good work. That's the kind of thing I like to see. Yes. Yes, more of that. Here's one from Quirty Weop the Original. My problem with inconsistencies between Star Trek stories is that so many of the inconsistencies are not necessary and pretty much exist because of laziness. I have the same reaction when they use technobabble instead of using the real science that would have worked just fine in the story at that point. I don't necessarily think it's laziness. I think, I mean, sometimes it is. Sometimes it might be laziness and sometimes it might just be that the writers don't care because it's not important to the story they're telling. Uh, but a lot of it is that particular shows, at least in my mind, ought to have the freedom to do things their way. Within boundaries, of course. I mean, you're doing a Star Trek show, so it's got to be a Star Trek show. But for me, the lines defining what is a Star Trek show are pretty broad. You know, there's a lot of space in there to play in. So you can make a Star Trek show that takes place in the same universe as all the other Star Trek shows and still have your Star Trek show be different and even have some of the events in your Star Trek show contradict the events of other Star Trek shows. And to me, it doesn't matter as long as it's good, because it's fiction. It's fiction. You can have things that are inconsistent. You can have logical uh, fallacies and, and incompatibilities and things that can't both be true in terms of events and character histories and et cetera, et cetera, um, in fiction, because it's fiction. You couldn't do that in reality. You can't break the rules of reality in reality, but you're not dealing with reality. You're dealing with fiction. So whether it's laziness or just the creators of an individual series wanting to do their own thing, as long as the show is good, I don't care. I usually do notice those things. Like, it's not like it goes completely over my head. I, I notice, and if it's a good show, I usually don't care. Here's one from William Sledge. Appreciate your Expanse reference. What is your opinion on the show? I personally really like it, but I would like to hear your thoughts on the show's writing and themes. So I thought it was great. I thought the acting was tremendous. I thought it had some really fantastic characters. Um, in terms of the themes, as you mentioned, I I love the the you know the the using a a, a sci-fi story in a sci-fi setting to tell a story about the conflict between the haves and the have-nots, you know, the the people who live on the in the belt, who are the workers, who are the lower class, who are the ones that make the more opulent life lived by the people in the inner solar system possible, and they they're being exploited and they're getting sick of it, and you know, um, I thought that was all fantastic and very timely, uh, as unfortunately those kinds of stories always seem to be. But yeah, so for its 
politics, for its for its character writing and its storytelling. I thought it was fantastic, and I liked the way they they made an effort to make it at least as scientifically plausible as they could. You know, it still takes, they take some liberties, you know, with making travel between planets and, you know, across the solar system a lot easier than it probably would be in real life. But it's not like Star Trek where they can just go to warp speed and zoom, zoom, zoom and all over the place. Like there are some concessions to reality and to the limitations of interplanetary travel that are in there and that they actually work into the story and use not just as you know, meaningless sci-fi detail that doesn't contribute anything other than making it more realistic, but that adds to the story and changes the way the stories are told. And um, I, I I really liked it. I, I liked The Expanse a lot. I liked it so much that I continued to watch it and be engrossed in it, even after they wrote out Jared Harris's character, which I was afraid, like, after Jared, because Jared Harris shows up, and Jared Harris is one of my favorite actors. Jared Harris shows up, and he's playing this great character, and I'm like, oh, yeah, Jared Harris. And then he is written out after a certain point, and I didn't miss him. Like, that's how good the show was, that one of my favorite actors is in the show, and then he's not in the show. And I like you know, the back half of the show after his character is written out just as much, if not more so than, than the first part where he is in it a lot. So yeah, The Expanse is a great show. Here's one from Gundam Kaiser. I mean, I don't see a reason why sufficiently inclined writers can't do compelling stories about characters, themes, and social issues while also addressing production inconsistencies. Well, I mean, there's no law against it. I just think it's a waste of time. <laughs> like, that's really what it comes down to. If If a writer... If it means that much to a writer to resolve a completely meaningless production inconsistency that is only there because we're dealing with a franchise that has passed through multiple creative regimes and multiple eras of production and technology across many, many decades, like if if it means that much to a writer to resolve that kind of inconsistency while also telling a story that's rooted in character and story and theme and, you know, really important stuff. I guess there's no reason not to if that's what they want to do. I just cannot fathom why it would be that important to anyone. But if that's what floats your boat, like, I'm not going to complain as long as you're actually telling me a good story in addition to scratching your nerd itch. Scratch your nerd itch if that's what you need to do to be a happy person. But first and foremost, please tell me a good story. And last one from the Klingons of Voyager and Enterprise video from Alan Ali. Wait, why didn't Steve just pause SimCity? Okay, so you need to work with me here, all right? I mean, it's it's kind of like like an unspoken contract between the viewer and and the creator. You know, I present a video, the video has a, a particular premise, and hopefully the viewer and myself as the creator, we, 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 we come to kind of a, a meeting of the minds where you accept the premise and then you watch how I explore the premise and you either like it or you don't. But it all starts with you saying, you know what, I'm going to come on board for this ride. I'm going to step on the boat. You know, you need to step on the boat with me here, Alan. And once you get on the boat, don't be talking about how well constructed the boat is. The boat is fine. Don't worry about the boat. Worry about where the boat is going. The boat is just there to take you someplace. So focus on that. You know, stop criticizing how well I build my boats. Now, these next several comments are from my video I did a couple of months ago about the terms Trekkie and Trekker. And this one is from Lassa Ehrenreich, who says, I recently heard in a podcast that getting Star Trek fans to accept new things is like swimming in syrup. <laughs> you, you heard correctly. Um, it's not all Star Trek fans. There are a lot of us that, that enjoy new things, different things, variations on the theme, fresh interpretations, shaking things up. Like there were a lot of, look, there were, there were Star Trek fans that hated the Kelvin timeline movies and not, and there were, there were, there were Star Trek fans that disliked them for all kinds of reasons that I would consider legitimate reasons. Like they watched them as movies and they gave them a chance and it just didn't work for them for whatever reason. And that's fine. But there were a lot of Star Trek fans that hated them on site just because they were different. That's not Captain Kirk. That's not Spock. That's not what the Enterprise looks like. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. There was a lot of that. 
But there was also a lot of, oh, this seems fresh and new and exciting and interesting and let's see where this goes, right? Um, so there's a mixture. The, the haters and the complainers always seem to be louder than the people that are of the more open-minded persuasion. But that doesn't mean that the open-minded people don't exist and aren't a part of the fandom and haven't always been a part of the fandom because they have, I would like to say we have, I would consider myself a part of that, of that group. Um, but there is a lot of resistance to new stuff, to stuff that's different, to stuff that is inconsistent with what has come before. And that happens every time there's a new phase of Star Trek, every time there's a new generation of, of production where it's a new slate of shows and it's new people in charge of making it. And, you know, there's always going to be resistance to it. And I don't think that's just the case for Star Trek. It's the case for comic books. It's the case for uh, Star Wars and, and other long running franchises that have passed through many creative hands. Every time there's another handoff, there's always going to be a group of fans that are like, I hate it just because it's not what it used to be. Uh, and Star Trek fans are no different, but Star Trek fans uh, have certainly perfected it. Here's one from Ron Jomero. The difference between the two is that there's no difference, except Trekkers like to believe there is, and Trekkies just don't care. I personally think that some folks just want to believe their fandom is better or more refined than someone else's, trying to elevate themselves rather than believe that we can all enjoy something equally. I did a, a, a stuffy short not too long ago uh, about this, where my version, the version of me, the fictional version of me in the short is talking to Stuffy, and uh, I'm trying to explain why my version of Star Trek fandom is superior to people who have a different version of it or, or find joy or entertainment in aspects of it that I don't. And uh, Stuffy basically asks, well, why? Why, why, is your, why are you one of the good ones and the people who you're saying are the bad ones are the bad ones? And I struggle to articulate some argument as to why that is. And finally, I give up and I just say, well, I, I just think my opinions are better. And that's really what it boils down to, isn't it? We just think as individuals, we just think our opinions are better. And I guess it's okay to privately think that, like it's okay to privately think like, well, yeah, but I mean, if anybody likes Star Trek for other reasons than my reasons, they're just doing it wrong. Like if you can't get past that, at least keep it to yourself. You know, you can think that all you want, I suppose, as long as it stays in your head and you're not a dick about it. Here's one from Rob Squared. My heart bleeds that you had to sit through something. Picard season three, you so clearly despised. Stay strong. Oh, no, it wasn't that bad. I didn't despise it. I, I mean, first of all, season three was better than season two. I mean, season two <laughs> was really rotten. Season three at least had a few things going for it and did have some episodes I thought were good. Uh, but even season two of Picard, which I have said repeatedly, I think is the worst season of any Star Trek show ever by far. Even that, I don't despise it. It's a TV show. You know, it's a bad TV show. I've seen lots of those. It wasn't painful to watch. It wasn't a hardship. It didn't ruin my life. It didn't ruin anything. It did not negatively impact my life at all. I mean, when when uh, season two of Picard was coming out, after every episode was released, usually the next day or within the next couple of days, I'd get a phone call from Jason, um, my best friend, who, I'm, who I reviewed season three with and who I'm currently reviewing season two of Strange New Worlds with. And he would call and he would say, did you see the new episode? And we would kind of talk and commiserate. And he would say, you know, Steve, the only reason I'm watching this is because I don't want you to have to go through this alone. And we would laugh because we both knew he was kidding. Like, it wasn't really a hardship. It didn't really hurt. It wasn't painful. It wasn't uh, harming me in any way. It wasn't making me angry. It would sometimes make me shake my head and make me go, Jesus, how could they possibly have done this? How how could this have made it on TV? Like, what is the explanation for this? But it does. It didn't upset me in any legitimate way. It wasn't something that bothered me after the episodes were over, after I was done writing about it or talking about it. It's a TV show. You know, it's a TV show. And a bad TV show is something that I have seen many, many times before. So I appreciate the condolences, but it's never necessary 
to give me a comforting pat on the back and say, it's okay, hang in there, when the thing you're consoling me over is that I watched a shitty TV show. Here's one from Opinions No One Cares About. I suppose next you'll tell me I went too far when I named my kids Riker, Odo, and Neelix. Oh no, of course not. I would never tell you that you went too far by naming your kids Riker, Odo, and Neelix. That's ridiculous. That's one of the most insensitive, judgmental things. No, I would never say that to you. I would say that you went too far by naming that one kid Neelix. Now, these next several comments are from my video about Captain Sisko's greatest nemesis. This one is from Kamala LSB, who says, I always thought it was funny that after Ducat's episode, where he fully stops pretending he's good and ever was good, he also tries to be Sisko. He sets up his little cult on Not DS9 as the emissary of the Not Prophets. He tries to be what Cisco is, but it all falls apart because he just can't fathom that Cisco could genuinely love the Bajarans rather than feel like they owe him something. Yes, and it's really stuff like that that makes Ducat, for me, the only real choice for Cisco's greatest nemesis. I mean, he is he is Cisco's opposite number. He's, uh, as someone else in one of the other comments describes him as Cisco's shadow self. And that's, that's what Ducat is. And you see that set up from the very first episode when we learned that Ducat was Cisco's immediate predecessor to commander of the station. Like Ducat was in charge of the station right up until the Cardassians handed it over. And then the Bajarans invited the Federation and Cisco shows up as the Starfleet commander of the station. So it was Ducat vacancy with, I guess, Kira kind of filling in, you know, as, as the temporary position until Cisco got there and then Cisco. So, you know, they are, they're, they're opposites from the very beginning. They're counterparts from the very beginning. And yeah, Ducat wants to be Cisco. He wants what Cisco has um, in terms of command of that space station again, in terms of the respect that Cisco gets from everybody, from the people that he works with, from the Bajarans, from, from everybody. Uh, Ducat doesn't have that. And Ducat feels like he's owed that. You know, uh, Ducat wants the spiritual position that Cisco has, and he knows he'll never get it from the prophet, so he eventually turns to the Paw Wraiths. And as I said in the video, I'm not a huge fan of that storyline for Ducat, but it makes sense with his character. Like, of course that's what he would want. You know, he he is Cisco's mirror image. So yeah, it's, I mean, there are lots of great villains in Deep Space Nine. In that video, I talk about several outstanding antagonists that were put up against Cisco. I mean, they're great. They're great characters. They were part of great stories, but it's got to be Ducat. It's got to be Ducat. There's, there's no other choice um, in terms of the way the show was written and the way those characters were written to, uh, to, to face off and reflect each other. Here's one from Cheddar's Salad. Speaking of Cisco being multifaceted, my favorite facet of his is one that isn't very explicit. He seems to have a passion for design. In the episode where everyone gets infected with a Klingon mutiny, Ben spends the whole episode building a weird clock from scratch. He also built a space sailboat and spent the final few episodes designing a house. Honestly, he probably sketched up that baseball cap and t-shirt you're wearing in his first month on the station. I love it because the show never draws attention to it. You know what? That's really interesting. And until you pointed that out, I had never thought about that or I never realized that. But that's a really good point. Cisco is, um, it's not just that he has an eye for design or a knack for design. He's a builder. His design is in the form of, of practical things that he can create, that he can construct. He's not so much a... I mean, you mentioned the, the hat, the, the Niner's cap and the shirt. I mean, I guess that would fall under the category of graphic design. And, and maybe he did come up with that. That's, that's a, really, a really cool thought that he you know, was musing one day after he got to the station. And he was like, if we had a baseball team, I'd call it the Niners. And here's what I think the logo could look like. Like that, that feels like something he may have done. But... Other than that hypothetical, maybe he designed the baseball cap logo, which I do think is a really neat idea. Uh, 
you know, like the other examples you mentioned, he he does, he he builds the clock, and yes, it's under the influence of some alien consciousness, but still, like Cisco is the only one who builds something of the other people that are infected. Uh, he designs his house that he wants to build for himself on Bajor after he retires. He builds the spaceship, the the ancient Bajoran spaceship that that he and Jake fly on in the episode Explorers, which is one of my favorite episodes, and it's stuff that he builds. You know, he's, 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 he's a builder. He's a constructor of things. And don't forget, he's also a cook. He's a chef that he gets from his father and cooking, uh, in the way that his dad does it, in the way that Cisco does it is also an act of creation. He's not just heating up some ingredients to throw together to have something to eat. He's creating a meal. He's cooking for his friends and his family. We see him doing that at various points throughout the series. We know that it's in his family tradition. That's what his father does. So he is a, a creative builder person. And you're right. They don't beat you over the head with it. You don't see him doing it all the time. You don't see him constantly talking about it. They don't even really make a point to ever say it. Because like in, in TNG, after a certain point, they decide that Picard is really super into archaeology. But once they introduce it, like they kind of have to tell you, oh, hey, Picard's really into archaeology. And they have him talk about, oh, I love archaeology. Archaeology is great. But with Cisco and this facet of his personality that you're pointing out, there's never a scene where Cisco is like, God, I love designing things. God, I love building things. It just really it just really makes me happy to build things and design things. He never says that. But we get it, or at least you get it, and now that you've pointed it out, I get it too. And I'm I'm really grateful to you for pointing that out because you're right. That's a really, really nice bit of characterization that they didn't push on too hard. It's just there for you to notice and appreciate. And you did. That's really cool. Here's one from Tiny Fist M. Eddington. Among all of them, he's the only one who proved an existential threat to Cisco. He's who came close to making himself lose himself, even though he, Eddington, was mostly, but not entirely, mistaken about the Javert versus Valjean comparison. The other villains really only had the power to try to kill him or have him killed. They never had the power to change him. Eddington is the villain that forces Cisco to betray his values as opposed to forcing him to live up to them. Ducat is someone that Cisco can only defeat by becoming his best self. Ducat is someone that Cisco needs to stand against and oppose and be the opposite of. So Ducat is evil. Cisco must be as good as he can be to defeat Ducat. With Eddington, Cisco doesn't defeat him by being his best self, by living up to his ideals, by by holding fast to his his morals. He says in that episode, I have to become the villain in order to defeat him. And that's what he does. So yes, you're right. Eddington is the one that drags Cisco down from his moral pedestal in order to defeat him. He's the one who convinces Cisco that I am not, unless I do something morally wrong, unless I set my values aside for the moment, I am not going to catch this guy. I am not going to beat this guy. You know, if I stick to my morals, he wins. And that is certainly a moral and a philosophical victory for Eddington. You know, the sort of tacit admission by Cisco that I couldn't beat you by being my best self. I had to compromise myself in order to beat you. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point. That's a really good point. I still think Ducat is the ultimate nemesis, but that is a really, really good argument in favor of Eddington. Here's one from St. Anselm's Fire. I thought she was a cult leader, but she's much worse. She's a self-published author. As a self-published author myself, that had me rolling. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you appreciated it. I hope everybody realizes that was all in good fun. I'm not trying to, like, seriously take a shit on self-published authors. I don't want to be that kind of an elitist, and I have no standing to be that anyway. My God, I make my living posting videos on YouTube. It's not like I had to go through a bunch of gatekeepers to do this. I mean, it's not like I have an agent. I've never, I've never sold a script. I've never taken part in any sort of organized professional filmmaking. Like I've never made a movie or participated in the making of like a professional, like studio financed movie. 
uh, or a TV show or any of the legitimate professional, you know, like the the TV and movie equivalents of being a published author, <laughs> right? So I have no, there's, I, I have not a leg to stand on. I, I, you know, self-published authors are my people. I'm like the, the audio visual equivalent of a self-published author. So, um, just, just giving you a little jazz, just giving you a little good natured ribbing is, is all that was. And I'm glad that at least one self-published author in the audience took it the way it was intended, uh, and appreciated it. Thanks. That's, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't piss off all of the self-published authors, but you know what, if I did, what are you going to do? Write a book? about it and publish it yourself. Ooh. And one more from the Cisco's Nemesis video, this one from Charles Brentner. The zygomatic bone is also known as the cheekbone. Presumably someone suffered a facial injury during their first baseball practice. The cheekbone. It's really interesting. No, I'm glad you pointed that out because I clearly had no idea what the uh, zygomatic bone was in that first video. So... Now, this next batch of comments is from my video where I take a cumulative look at season three of Star Trek Picard called To Serve Fan. This first one is from People See This, who says, I think my biggest problem with this season was that the moral of the story was that technology is corrupting our youth, and only these old people with old ways and old tools can stop it. The old ways are better, essentially. Look to the past for your salvation. It was literally the opposite of what Gene wanted the show to be. Like, you'd have to know all the right answers and do the opposite on purpose for it to be this bad. Well, I don't think that's what happened. I don't think Terry Metalis said, let me do the opposite of what Star Trek has traditionally been on purpose. Like I say in the video, I think instead of being the result, the, the, the intentional result of the creative decisions that were made in season three of Picard. I think that is the accidental result of those decisions. I think Terry Metalis and his fellow writers set out to do a story where the only hope to save the galaxy were the original characters from TNG, was Captain Picard and his Enterprise D crew. Like they wanted to arrange the story so that only our TNG heroes could possibly save the day. And that's what they did. And that was their goal, and that was primarily what they cared about. And if anybody during the pre-production process pointed out to one of them, to Terry Metalis or one of his producers or writers, hey, it kind of seems like the story we're telling is carrying the message that uh, old people are better than young people, and the only salvation for the present or the future is to look to the past. Like, is that really the message we want to send? If anybody realized that and pointed it out, obviously that message or, or that objection was discarded. Uh, and maybe the reason they discarded it was they said, well, that's not what we're trying to say. People will understand, you know, that that's why the, the reason we're doing it, that we want to, to, to funnel everything to Picard and, and, you know, the old timer saving the day, right? People will get it. But it's still there, whether it's there intentionally or not, like it's still there. And, you know, it, it wasn't my major problem with the season, but it was an issue I had with it. Like I did mention it in the video. And I do think that it's not the best, it's not the best message for anything to have. And certainly not the best message for a Star Trek show to have, which has always been forward-looking and optimistic about the future and about the younger generation. Like that's, that's been part of, of Star Trek's message from the very beginning. You know, the, the kids are going to be all right. The, the future is in good hands. Um, you know, so for the last season of Picard to, again, I think very strongly, accidentally tell the opposite message uh, is a real shame. And it's something that should have been realized and should have been corrected for. I, I, I completely believe that. Like somebody should have said, oh, wait, we can't tell the story this way because there's a very obvious implication if we do it this way. Somebody should have caught that and changed something so it didn't convey that message. But I don't think the message was there intentionally. I think it's, it's, it's there because of the tunnel vision. They were so focused on making everything about the, the legacy characters and so focused on the fan service and making it all Picard and Riker and the old timer save the day that Everything else, I think, just kind of fell by the wayside. And if they did notice it, they didn't care because the show wasn't, they didn't want the show to be about that. They apparently didn't want the show to be about anything socially relevant, 
They just wanted it to be about, oh, look, it's the people you know. Look, look, it's the old ship. Look, it's the old crew. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Huh? Huh? That's all they wanted. And that's what they focused on. And this is what we got. Here's one from Josh Harden. The reason for Tuvok being there when Seven is promoted is organic. He is a higher-up admiral at Starfleet Security, debriefing Seven following the events of the Borg coup and the death of her commanding officer, as well as many other crew members, and the temporary loss of her ship immediately following her official promotion to acting captain. There's a lot to unpack there, and it makes sense that Tuvok would get that case given his role. So here's my problem with the argument you're making there. A sufficiently motivated and clever writer can come up with that kind of an argument to make any fan service cameo seem organic, right? To me, it takes more than that to make a... Because look, we, but we all know the real reason Tuvok was there. We know the reason Tuvok's there, just like we know the reason Shelby's there, just like we know the reason Roe is there. They're there for old, long-time viewers of Star Trek to see a familiar face and go, Oh, look, it's Tuvok! Oh, look, it's Shelby. Oh, look, it's Roe. That's why those characters are there. And yes, any writer worth their salt can invent an organic sounding explanation for why they're there. Well, of course Tuvok was there. He's an old friend of Seven's and he's a captain. And of course he's conducting her performance review because they know each other. There's, you, you can justify it all sorts of ways. It doesn't change what it is. It's a fan service cameo that doesn't need to be there. That's there to pop a certain reaction from the audience, not to serve the interests of the story. If you had wanted to write the story where Seven still is thinking about quitting, but ultimately changes her mind and accepts promotion because she learns that Captain Shaw was going to recommend her for promotion and actually he secretly thought the world of her even though he was really a dick to her. Like, you could have done all of that and accomplished all of those things without having Tuvok there at all. Without even having another character there. You didn't have to literally show us Seven's performance review. You didn't have to have her sitting across the table from another character at all. You could have come at it from a different direction altogether. And I would argue, again, I, I, can, I can't say this for sure because I'm imagining things and I'm comparing things that don't exist except in my mind to what actually happened on the show. So I can't say for sure, but I can easily imagine a better way of writing those scenes and getting that information out and getting Seven as a character to that same place where she is promoted to captain without having Tuvok there at all. And I can certainly think of ways to get them to where they were earlier in the series without having that Tuvok cameo pop up in what, episode five or six when it was the change thing? It turned out it wasn't really Tuvok. Like, you can invent justifications for any fan service item that you can imagine. That doesn't mean that it belongs there. And it doesn't mean that it's good writing. You can justify bad writing and make it seem like good writing. It's still not good writing. Here's one from Matthew Tyler Jones. The thing that pisses me off about the Enterprise G is the Titan has its own nostalgia. I never read any of the novels, but lots of people did. And to them, the Titan is representative of a whole bunch of canon, the best of which might be referenced in a new USS Titan show. This is a good point, but also to me, the more important point is the Titan has its own legacy in the show that you just watched. The Titan does meaningful, important things in season three of Picard. Like, never mind the novels and, and the history of the Titan A and Riker's original ship, the Titan, and all the stuff that, you know, happened mostly off screen in comics and novels and stuff that, you know, is, you know, not officially canon. Like, I, I think that's, that's a good point. And it's a good um, observation about, you know, in a sense, canon is whatever the viewer thinks it is. Like if you if you read those Titan novels and you think that those stories that they told about Riker being on the Titan are part of the fictional universe, then that's what they are for you, you know? But even without that, just let's just focus on what happens on screen in season three of Picard, the stuff that is indisputably canon. Does the Titan not deserve to still be the Titan? The Titan helped to save Starfleet. It didn't do as much as the Enterprise D, but stuff that people did on the Titan still contributed a great deal to the defeat of the enemy at the end of that season. And our heroes spent almost the entire season on the Titan. 
Their adventures happened on the Titan. Has the Titan not earned any more respect than to be renamed as another ship? To have its legacy swept to the side, rendered a mere historical footnote, so that we can rename it into another enterprise? So instead of being the Titan A and having its own legacy and its own history, now that gets whited out and it's like, oh, now it's yet another enterprise. It's, it just, it, it makes no sense. Here's one from the cynical optimist who says, I'd just like to leave this quote from Ira Stephen Bear here. The idea of fandom is a dangerous thing, and I think one of the worst things about the business right now is the idea of trying to appeal to the fans. Give the fans what they want. Really play up to the fans. What I used to say on Deep Space Nine all the time is, it's not up to us to give the fans what they want. I don't care what they want. What we do is we give the fans what we think they need for it to be a good show. I agree with every single word of that. I think that should be the creative ethos of every writer's room, regardless of whether it's a Star Trek show or Star Wars or Batman or Superman or Spider-Man or any established property with a large and committed fan base. The best form of fan service is a good story. And the attitude should be not give the fans what they want, but the fans don't know what they want until we show it to them. Um, you know, that's, that's why I say it's fine to be a fan. If you're a Star Trek fan and you get hired as a writer for a Star Trek show, it's completely fine to be a Star Trek fan. But don't forget, when you come to work, you're there to be a writer, not to be a fan. And your goal is to tell the best story that you can tell, not to be a fan. You're not a fan anymore. You're a writer, you're a creator, you know, and your your loyalty is to the story, not to the fans. If you tell a good enough story, the fans will be happy. Not all of them, but probably most of them. If you do your job right, you can never tell, and it's all a matter of taste, but if you do a good job and you tell a good enough story, they'll, you'll probably make most of them happy. And the ones that you don't get, fuck them. Not literally. Here's one from the Doc Nastrian. I love how you walk the fine line of calling people out for being wrong while also being completely happy that they are enjoying the same source material, albeit in a different way. It's like you know we're fucking nerds, but deep down inside you know you're a nerd too, and as long as we all let each other enjoy stuff in our own nerdy way, we can be friends. Love these, keep it up. Well, thank you. I mean, it's not even that deep down. Like, I know right out front that I'm just as big of a nerd as anybody else. I am reminded quite often that, especially with Star Trek, that m my points of contact with these stories are, are different than those of a lot of other fans. Um, there are things that a lot of Star Trek fans are extremely passionate about that I just am indifferent to. You know, at least when I'm watching the show, like I look, I like the ships, you know, I like, I like talking about starships. I have my opinions on what are the best looking ships and what are the best looking uniforms and all that stuff. Like I, I have opinions about stuff like that, but I don't want to see any of that in the fucking show. That's stuff that like fans talk about amongst ourselves after we're done watching the show. I don't want to see characters talking about how cool the ships are in the show. I, I often say, I don't want the characters in the show to talk like they're people who watch the show. I want them to be people who are alive in the universe of that show. I don't want them to talk like fans of the show. They're not fans of the show. They're not watching the show. They're in the show, <laughs> you know? Um, but, but you know, so my, my frame of reference and my perspective and my points of contact are different than a lot of other fans. Um, but there are also a lot of fans who see it the way I do and, and view the show in, in a similar way. So there's, you know, it's all, like I keep saying, it's all a matter of taste. And I'm just as big of a nerd as anybody else. Um, and I sometimes get annoyed at the people over there, just like they get annoyed at me and the people over here, you know, in my bunch. And that's fine. As long as we, as like you say in your question, as long as we, as long as we realize that it's all a matter of taste, that nobody's right or wrong you're not, there's no such thing as correct or incorrect when it comes to evaluating art. You know, if you think the Mona Lisa is the worst painting you've ever seen, you're not wrong. 
you have an opinion that is contrary to a popular consensus, but it doesn't make you wrong and them right. It's a difference of opinion. You know, I think Deep Space Nine is the best Star Trek show. There are people who think Voyager is the best Star Trek show. We disagree. I think that I'm right in a subjective sense. You know, I, I, I agree with me, <laughs> not with them, but I don't think one of us is factually incorrect. And I don't think one of us has, has, you know, forgotten something or missed something or done something wrong or made some kind of mistake to reach their opinion. It is what it is. It's a matter of taste, you know? And as long as we remember that and we're not assholes or bigots or fucking Nazis or, you know, mistreating people or, or you know, whatever, then we can all be friends and we should be. And we should enjoy Star Trek in our own ways and talk to each other about it and be able to have good natured arguments about it and just enjoy it. If it's not here to enjoy and to enlighten us and to make our lives better, then why are we watching it? And finally, these next few comments are from my video about Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, and why I consider it to be the best Star Trek series finale. This one is from Adam Holliday. The only reason this pips Wrath of Khan for me is simply the fact that Kirk and Chang meet face to face. The scene where Kirk calls fire is one of the most edge-of-your-seat scenes in all of Star Trek. Love the score, but often wonder how good it would have been had James Horner done it. Nicholas Meyer must be the most underutilized director in Hollywood. A lot of people, myself included, would say that Kirk and Khan never being face-to-face -face in Star Trek II is one of the strengths of that movie and shows that you can have a very real conflict between characters that creates genuine tension and suspense and emotion without them coming face to face. Like, it's purely a battle of wits. They don't even, they're not even in the same room with each other one time in that movie. And so to me, that's not, I don't take points away from that for Star Trek II. I, I, might, I give it extra credit. I'm like, hell yeah, that's great that you can create such a, a compelling conflict between characters that never even occupy the same space. Um, but, but of course, it's a battle of wits between Kirk and Chang as well, because it doesn't come down to a fist fight between them. It comes down to a battle of wits. It comes down to Kirk and Spock um, outsmarting him, as opposed to Kirk, you know, getting him alone in a room and beating his ass. So they're both battles of wits. It's just that Kirk and Chang get a little bit more direct interaction person to person, you know, and, you know, Chang is the prosecutor of Kirk and McCoy's trial. And there's, there, there are more interpersonal exchanges between the two of them, you know, when they're in close proximity than there are of Kirk and, and Khan. But um, they're both similar kinds of conflict, which I think is interesting. Um, as for, look, James Horner is one of my favorite film composers ever. I love his scores to Star Trek II and Star Trek III. I think the, the, the hero theme of Star Trek II is fantastic. It's one of my favorite Star Trek themes in the entire history of the franchise. But I'm glad that they hired uh, Cliff Eidelman to do the score for Star Trek VI. One of the things I love about Star Trek VI is how different it is from the other movies. Now, it has a lot of similarities as well. It's not completely different. You know, it, 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 has a lot of elements that are continuations of the films that came before it, but there's a lot about it that is it's, that is its own thing, you know, and that's what I love about it. And I love the score. I love the fact that the score for Star Trek VI, it, with the exception of a couple of instances of the Alexander Courage fanfare, the score for Star Trek VI is completely original. It's not picking up from James Horner. It's not picking up from Jerry Goldsmith. It is Cliff Eidelman's own score, but it's classic Star Trek. It's the perfect score for that movie. And I, as much as I love James Horner's work, like I've heard James Horner's Star Trek II score, and it's brilliant. I don't need to hear it again for Star Trek VI. Not that he would have done like a note for note import. He would have written new music for Star Trek VI, but I would imagine a lot of his themes would have been the same as the ones he used in Star Trek II and Star Trek III because that's his Star Trek music. He would have, he would have gone to that and, and built his new score out of those parts. And I like that I got something new with Star Trek VI's score, which is also one of my favorite Star Trek scores and one of my favorite film scores, period. I would not have wanted to not have that 
in exchange for another James Horner score when I already got two great ones, you know? Bus Imogen says, I also really liked the touch of adding all the main TOS actor signatures at the end. A nice little goodbye painter's signature from the crew at the completion of their work of art. Yeah, I love that. And I am sure I was just one of many, many Trekkies who smiled uh, big smiles of recognition and satisfaction several years ago when we were sitting in theaters at the end of Avengers Endgame, and they used the exact same gimmick to sign off the uh, the original Avengers at the end of that phase of, of the MCU. That was really cool. And I sat there watching Endgame and thinking, this is really cool. This is really nice. It feels like an end. You know, it feels like like a conclusion that we've built up to for all these movies. And now here it is. And it really feels important and special and appropriate. And they totally Star Trek 6 it. <laughs> like, this isn't their thing. They borrowed this from Star Trek 6. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was really cool. It was really cool. And I agree. It was a, it was a perfect little extra touch. Um, and it's the actor's signatures. You know, it's not the characters. It's the actors leaving this message uh, to us in the audience. It's it's the authors signing their work at its completion. You know, uh, it's, it's, yeah, I agree. It's a really nice touch. Here's one from user XV1G73KX5M. Boy, I was, I was almost going to choose that one when I started my YouTube channel, but I'm glad I went with my name instead. Um, if people weren't sure of the Cold War allegory, there is an old Vulcan proverb, only Nixon can go to China, pretty much sums it up. <laughs> that, that is pretty on the nose. And that's also a great Nicholas Meyer joke. Nicholas Meyer, speaking of what makes him such a great filmmaker for Star Trek. He loved to put in little jokes like that, that 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 broke the universe, but in, in little ways, in winking ways. You know, I, he also does that in another line of the movie that I mentioned in the video is my favorite line in the movie, or my favorite joke in the movie, um, when Spock says, um, an ancestor of mine maintains that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth, which is, of course, a very famous quote from Sherlock Holmes, who is a pretend person. So, and, and there are people who say like, oh, you can reconcile that by saying that Spock is saying that Arthur Conan Doyle is his ancestor. And yeah, okay, you can say that. That's not nearly as much fun though, as interpreting it as Spock saying that Sherlock Holmes is his ancestor, which again, if you really want to try and explain it, which I don't really think is the point, and I, it's not, you know, but if you really try to explain it, you could, you, there are a couple possibilities. There's, you know, it could be Doyle. It could be that within the fictional universe of Star Trek, Sherlock Holmes was a real person, which then creates a problem of, well, then what's with Data and Geordi acting out Sherlock Holmes' short stories on the holodeck? That clearly seems to indicate that Holmes was a fictional character. Aha, but you could reconcile that by assuming that within the Star Trek universe, the adventures of Sherlock Holmes actually happened, and Watson, as is the case in the stories themselves, is merely retelling, is relating events to the readers that actually happened to him and Holmes. So the stories exist, and uh, the 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 uh, the character of Sherlock Holmes also exists as a real person in that universe. It's the the Watsonian interpretation of Sherlock Holmes as opposed to the Doyleist interpretation. Um, so and again, that's way too much analysis. I don't think you even. I mean, it's fun to do that. Obviously, I was having a good time throwing out those possibilities just now, but. It's just the idea of, oh, Spock is saying that his ancestor is Sherlock Holmes. So it's one fictional character saying that another fictional character is one of his ancestors. Um, and, you know, I just, I, it's, a, it's a perfect Nicholas Meyer joke. And, uh, you know, Spock saying there's an old Vulcan proverb only, oh, there's an old Vulcan proverb only Nixon could go to China is the same sort of thing. So is um, Gorkon saying you haven't experienced Shakespeare until you've read it in the original Klingon. Like it just, Meyer loves to put in little jokes like that, that reference the real world in ways that kind of shake the fiction of Star Trek a little bit. And God, I love those. God, I love those. And finally, last comment. This one is from Avarod who says, for me, what makes this ending so great 
is that it gives me closure in a way I no longer feel the need to ever hear anything about them again, but at the same time, I can imagine how their stories might continue. I dream and fantasize what the adventures of Captain Sulu and the Excelsior might be, or what all the other characters will do. There are so many great possibilities, yet I don't feel I need that content because the story of Captain Kirk and his crew is concluded. It's the kind of ending that leaves you wanting more, but at the same time knowing that you shouldn't have any more. It's, it's like finishing a perfect meal. You know, you've cleaned your plate, you've had your dessert, you've had your coffee. It was all so delicious. There's a desire to have more, but at the same time, you also, you recognize, no, if I, I stop right now, I back away from the table, it's perfect like this. And with Star Trek VI, it's, yes, of course, you could continue telling stories about these characters, and they did. Like, there are novels with the characters that are set after Star Trek VI. There's a novel that picks up right after Star Trek VI ends that's about, you know, an adventure that they have right after Star Trek VI. There's all kinds of possibilities that you could, but the point is, it's better if you don't. The, as you say, the story's over. We've reached the perfect endpoint. They've saved the day one last time. You know, the Federation and the Klingons have reached uh, a point of, of change and, and, and resolution, but also, you know, pointing to the future. The Enterprise itself is sailing off to be decommissioned. Kirk and his officers, there are either at the ends of their careers or are going to move on to other phases of their careers, but their time on the Enterprise is over. And it just feels right. It feels done. And it feels like this is it. This isn't the end of their lives. Like if, if they were real people in the real world, they're not all dying. But this is the end of their story. This is the end of our journey with them. And it would feel wrong to just pick up the journey again and keep going. You know, you reach the perfect ending, you leave it there. That's it, you know? And yeah, they brought Kirk and Scotty and Chekhov back for generations, and I, I do wish they hadn't done that. Um, and we've revisited the characters in different forms since then. But, but this original crew, this original cast, it's their last time all in a movie together, and you I just it couldn't have been any better. And it leaves you wanting more, but it also leaves you satisfied. And that's the perfect ending. You know, you know that you're, you want to see them again, but at the same time, you don't want to see them again because you've seen all of them that, that you need to see, you know, it's the perfect ending, which is the complete opposite of this, because this is not the perfect ending because I am definitely coming back to do this again and again and again and again and again until we're all dead. So look forward to that, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining me. That was the last comment. That's the end of this video. Um, I appreciate all of the comments. Please keep leaving them on my Star Trek videos and all the rest of my videos. I really appreciate it. If you would like to become a supporter of this channel, you can do it by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shives or becoming a channel member by just clicking the join button. Or if you don't want to make a recurring monthly gift, you can also just make a one-time gift by clicking the thanks button or sending me a gift via PayPal or Venmo. The links for that are in the video description. Um, once again, I appreciate it. I couldn't do it without you. Those of you who watch, those of you who contribute, um, those of you who just like and share the videos and are just a part of the audience. I, I, I could not do this without your attention, without your support. So thank you very, very much for allowing me to have the best job in the world and also, coincidentally, the only job that I am remotely qualified for. I'll see you next time, everybody. Take care.